Having a wonderful time. You know, Lee, you and I have seen this entire history of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame from the very beginning. We have. We saw the push to bring the Rock Hall here, and of course, what a, what a great institution it's turned out to be. And, and really, it's about people, it's about music, and I think it just gets yeah. better all the time. Isn't that the truth? Yeah. Well, you know, Leon, a major piece of Cleveland's rock and roll history mm -hmm. truly belongs to the Agora Ballroom. It's had several locations, but it was on East 20. 4th Street between Chester and Payne that it really claimed a piece of history of its own. Tonight we're going to revisit the Agora's reign in rock music. The Agora was the pinnacle, the total pinnacle of the club scene. I mean, it was, you know, that was, it was the gold standard. Michael Stanley lived it as a Cleveland musician, and Agora empresario Hank Lacanti was the man behind the curtain. When Lacanti started booking Monday concerts in 1970, the Agora hit the big time. The Monday night after the Agora became huge. We were mobbed. We had lines going from our place to Chester and from our place to Payne Avenue. As the decade progressed, Cleveland solidified its reputation as the rock and roll capital, and the Agora Ballroom was the seat of power, where for two bucks on a Monday, you could see legends in the making and breaking onto the national scene. Peter Frampton, Robin Trower, Robin Trower opening for two dollars. I had uh, Ted Nugent, Bob Seger opening for two dollars. I saw Springsteen there, I saw the police there, the Ramones there, you know, everybody in between. And it was just. Um, as you said before, I mean, you would just went down to see who was there. It might not even be a type of music that you were totally drawn to, but it's like, well, this is Monday, and we go to the Agora. You know, it was, it was a regular thing. The Michael Stanley Band debuted at the Agora. It was a stage that opened a lot of doors for bands because of a mutually beneficial relationship between the Agora and radio rock powerhouse WMMS. It was a great time to be in a band. It was a great time for radio. It was a great time for live music scene club-wise. It all kind of came together, this perfect storm. There was a whole network of clubs around the country that you had to play. You had to play that if you were going to get anywhere in that city. And w with uh, you know, the combination of the Agora and MMS at the time, it was a total way to break, break in this market. If you, had, if you could do well at the Agora and you got MMS behind you, you were going to be successful in the market if you were any good. The Agora was also a magnet for musicians who came to network and see what other bands were doing. Thursday was our college ID night, and we had a band called Circus. Great band. And we would draw a thousand people on a Thursday and, and more until some other band guy stole my drummer. <laughs> <laughs> Did you coach the circus drummer? I yes, did. Yes, and, he and, did. And thereby, <laughs> thereby, you know, infuriating not only the band, but their crowd as well, and uh, losing them forever. It was a heady time that will never be duplicated. But without question, many successful bands still point to Cleveland's Agora as a milestone in their careers. For Hank Licotti, who started out selling jukeboxes, it was a labor of love. That's why I went in the jukebox business. I used to have all the records from all the greats, and uh, it, it was, I loved to watch a band create something and go to the next level. Michael did that. It was a great place to, to grow, and he let you grow. He let you grow, he let you grow an audience, and, and he let, you know, supported you in that, and that, was not a, that wasn't a necessarily normal thing in, in most cities. So, as Cleveland musicians, we were incredibly lucky to have Hank be the forefront of the whole thing. 